I will now show you a vector analytic solution to Torricelli's problem. It was clearly inspired by Heron's problem, even though it came more than 15 centuries later. And it is this. Given three points in the plane, A, B, and C, to find the point so that the sum of the distances to A, B, and C is as small as possible. So I think you can see the similarity to Heron's problem. And of course we would like to solve it by the same approach. But in this case, there is no curve to parameterize. So what we're going to do is introduce one. So let's introduce an arbitrary curve, could be a straight line but doesn't have to be a straight line, that passes through the optimal point. Here it is. So now we have a curve just like we did in Heron's problem and we can refer it to a parameter alpha. And we will now introduce three vectors similar to the vectors that we introduced for Heron's problem. And they will be capital R sub A, capital R sub B, and capital R sub C. And each one of them is a function of the parameter alpha. And so the objective function is the sum of the lengths of these three vectors, and so it is too a function of alpha. You will notice that I dropped the argument alpha from each of the terms, just to keep the expression shorter. So we will now differentiate this function and equate the derivative to zero, because the point that we're looking for corresponds to the smallest value of this function. Now we've already done this task before, so I won't repeat the details. Instead I'll just summarize the conclusion. And what we'll find is that each one of these terms will be proportional to the common tangent to this curve, which we'll denote by little t of alpha, and in parentheses we'll have the sum of the three unit vectors, we'll label them by n sub a, n sub b, and n sub c, that point in the directions of these vectors. So let me write down this expression and draw these vectors. So, this is just about the final analytic answer. So from this answer, well, what's the answer? We have to equate this expression to zero. So what can we conclude from this answer? Can we conclude that this sum in yellow is zero? No, we can't, yet. All we can conclude at this point is that the sum is orthogonal to the vector t. That's all. So are we stuck and can we move no further? Well, no. We must now remember that the curve that we drew was arbitrary. So this sum is orthogonal to the tangent to this curve, but it's also orthogonal to the tangent to any other curve that we could have drawn through this point. So it must be simultaneously orthogonal to any direction of any line that passes through this point. So from that, we can conclude that this sum must be zero. So you see how we take advantage of the arbitrariness of the curved line that we chose to draw through the optimal point. So that's our final analytical conclusion. The sum of the three unit vectors must equal zero. So in other words, this point need to be positioned in such a way that the resulting unit vectors that point in the directions of these segments add up to zero. That's the analytical conclusion. But what's the geometric interpretation? Well, if you really think about it, the only way to arrange three unit vectors so that their sum is zero is to make them point at, I can't do it with my fingers, 
120 degrees to each other, like this. I hope my drawing is pretty good, but these three angles must all be equal. And so the tips of these vectors form an equilateral triangle. And each one of these angles is 120 degrees. So that's the geometric conclusion, that each one of these angles must be 120 degrees. So if such a point exists, then it's actually not hard to show geometrically that that point would be unique, because it would be the intersection of three circles. But you will find that in some situations, this, for instance, when one of the angles is more obtuse than 120 degrees of this outer triangle ABC, then this point I think would coincide with, that up to, with the vertex associated with that obtuse angle. But other than that, this point would be unique. And you once again see just how powerful our analytic framework is. We really, forward, we really followed just straight forward steps and applied strict rules of differentiation and a little bit of algebraic insight, I would say, to arrive at our beautiful final answer. And it's important to know that this problem, too, has a geometric solution which has nothing to do with vector algebra. And it's a very beautiful solution. I believe it was inspired by Heron's solution. And it involves a very sophisticated rotation. And I talk about it in my first lecture on tensor calculus. But to tell you the truth, I don't remember that solution, even though I do remember that it was very beautiful. But what I enjoy the most at this point is Analysis like this, where all you need to do is carefully define your problem, express it in algebraic terms via the dot product, and once you've done that, the problem is pretty much solved. From that point on, all you can do is follow the rules of calculus, or the rules of vector calculus, and it gives you the feeling of sitting back and enjoying the movie. And that's kind of what's happening.